Okay, great. We will get underway for the Campaign Actions Health Equity Toolkit, how to use it and how to share it. <clears throat> so greetings and welcome. Thank you all for taking time to join today's webinar. We are so excited to have Drs. Piri Ackerman Barger and Lisa Martin join us today. They are going to share how to best use at the Campaign for Actions Health Equity Toolkit and how you can teach others to use it as well. This webinar talk topic was requested by one of our action coalitions. So thank you to the Montana folks who planted the seed. Uh, before we go further, I do want to mention we are recording today's webinar. If you miss a section or would like to pass it on to a colleague, which we highly encourage you to do, you can find the recording by going to www.campaignforaction.org forward slash webinars. I would really like to um, take the opportunity to thank all of the authors of the toolkit, Perry Ackerman Barger, Jasmine Cooper, Regina Eddy, Claudio Galtieri, Lisa Martin, Barbara Nichols, and Adriana Perez, as well as the members of our Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion Steering Committee who reviewed the toolkit. Next slide, please, Jasmine. Now back to Perry and Lisa. For the sake of time, I'm not going to read their full biographies, but uh, they will be made available on our website along with the recording. Dr. Piri Ackerman Barger is Associate Dean of Health Equity, Diversity and Inclusion, as well as a clinical professor and director of faculty development for education and teaching at the University of California, Davis, Betty Irene Moore School of Nursing. Dr. Ackerman Barger is also a senior fellow for the Future of Nursing Campaign for Action. Dr. Lisa Martin is a clinical associate professor with the University of Minnesota and a member of the Latu Flambeau Band of Lake Superior Chippewa Indians in Wisconsin. She is also a diversity consultant for the Future of Nursing Campaign for Action. Dr. Martin is a past president of the National Alaska Native American Indian Nurses Association. Thank you for joining today, Piri and Lisa. And at this point, Piri, please take it away. Thank you, Wynn. Um, if we could go to the next slide, I wanted to let you know that this work is informed and guided by the Future of Nursing Campaign for Action's Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion Steering Committee, whose work is inspired by the belief that everyone regardless of race, religion, creed, ethnicity, age, gender, sexual orientation, or any aspect of their identity, including where they come from and where they live, work, and play deserves to live the healthiest life possible. The Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion Steering Committee works closely with communities and thought leaders from across the country to identify barriers to health. Moreover, the committee engages communities by building bridges that leverage policy systems that promote, drive, and sustain a culture of health and health equity. So I wanted to talk with you a little bit about um, the notion of equity and um, equality, and if we could go ahead and change the slide. Uh, so I think it's important for us to really understand that equity and equality there are two different concepts, but they're not in opposition to each other. Um, we need equity to achieve equality. When you think about equality, this is fundamental to who we are in the United States. Our constitution was created with the notion of equality and really what equality refers to are human rights and the idea of valuing both communities and individuals. That said, we know that the needs of different communities and individuals are different. And because of that, we need the concept of equity, which has to do with the distribution of resources, services, opportunity, and access based on need. Um, if you would go ahead and uh, go to the next slide. The image that you see here, this is, um, this is a, a classic image, an important image. This is the notion of equality versus equity. And so one of the things that we need to understand is that if we use a equality model when an equity model is needed, then we can actually cause some harm. And that's what this image shows that in the top, everyone is being treated the same by having the exact same bicycle. And we can tell that that same bike doesn't work for everybody in that image. 
versus the notion of equity means that we get people the kind of bicycle that they need. So in terms of operationalizing this, it's it, although fundamentally in terms of fairness, we do wanna treat all of our patients fairly and justly, but that doesn't mean that we treat all of our patients or our students the same. We need to treat them based on what their need is. Um, could we go to the next slide, please? So, uh, and just one more click. So if we could, um, yeah, thank you. Um, if, if we could spend a moment just determining what we mean by the notion of health equity. So Paula Braveman has been in this space for a really long time. Um, this is from a blog posted by Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. And this definition really resonates. It says health equity means that everyone has a fair and just opportunity to be as healthy as possible. This requires removing obstacles to health such as poverty, discrimination and their consequences, including powerlessness and lack of access to good jobs with fair pay, quality education and housing, safe environments and healthcare. Next slide. Uh, this is another definition and you know, there, there are many ways to look at health equity and I see these as being complementary. This is by Kamara Jones. Um, and she says, health equity is the assurance of conditions for optimal health for all people. Achieving health equity requires valuing all individuals and populations equally. So she's using the term valuing, the value is equal, but this recognizes and rectifies historical injustices. Um, and when people ask, why do we keep needing to go back and understand our history? It's because the legacy of our history remains in our policies and outcomes today. Um, and we also need to provide resources according to need. She says health disparities will be eliminated when health equity is achieved. And you'll see the citation for that below. So next slide. So one of the things that I think is really helpful for us in thinking about nursing um, is the, the future of nursing report 2020-2030 uh, it, for me, it was just um, so validating and inspiring. And it really asks us to think about what is the role of nurses that we are central to. We are really part of the ability to move the process of health equity forward. And so in the um, report, they say, a nation cannot fully thrive until everyone, no matter who they are, where they live, or how much money they make, can live the healthiest life possible. And helping people live their healthiest life is and always has been the essential role of nurses. Nurses then have a critical role to play in achieving the goal of health equity. So there's the chapter and the page number. And so our health equity toolkit is really about where do we start this process? How do we begin to conceptualize how we can make a difference in this? Um, so you'll see a citation for the um, Health Equity Toolkit from the Campaign for Action. And we do update that periodically as we find new and amazing resources to share with you. So I'm gonna hand it over to Lisa. Excuse me, thank you. Um, yes, so now I would like to talk about the toolkit and what it offers. Next slide, please. So here is the purpose statement. Um, I'll read it to you to provide action-based strategies and concrete steps for individuals, communities, and healthcare facilities to promote and sustain a culture of health. So the toolkit shares resources and examples of communities in action. So we hope to facilitate community dialogue and meaningful partnerships that result in the identification of collective health goals that inspire concrete, actionable community initiatives that will improve health outcomes. Next slide, please. Thank you. This is an image of the toolkit's first page, its title page. And the toolkit um, includes a step-by-step -step, uh, instructions to use and navigate this document. The toolkit 
toolkit was designed to guide and support nursing efforts to address social determinants of health, or SDOH, to advance health equity in their communities. If you're not familiar with the social determinants of health factors, the toolkit is designed to provide step-by-step -step instructions on how to engage stakeholders and potential funders to address health equity. Each section is standalone. And it's best to start with the section that applies to your coalition's needs. Each, each a section includes descriptions and definitions, introducing topics, current evidence or best practices and resources, and including interactive webinars to inspire action. Next slide, please. Now a few words on the target audience. The Health Equity Toolkit was designed to guide and support nurses in their efforts to address the social determinants of health and to advance health equity in their communities. Although the toolkit was designed for nurses, it will benefit all healthcare providers, community members, healthcare stakeholders, businesses, healthcare facilities, consumer advocates, and anyone who's interested in creating meaningful healthcare changes in their community. Next slide, please. On the Campaign for Action website, you can find more information about the toolkit and a copy of the toolkit itself. We update the toolkit periodically as new resources are discovered and developed. The Future of Nursing Campaign for Action's Health Equity Toolkit is organized using the acronym ADPI, A-D-P-I-E, which includes the five steps of the nursing process, assessment, diagnosis, planning, implementation, and evaluation. Next slide, please. This slide is a quick overview of the topics and sections included in the toolkit. One approach is to start with, excuse me, one approach is to start with sections one through three, which include a social determinants of health survey uh, to assess nurses' knowledge, readiness and willingness and capacity to take action on the social determinants of health in their practice setting. Based on the survey results, we offer interactive webinars and references for those who would like more information. Section one provides overview and purpose of the toolkit. And then sections two through seven provide a stepwise approach to moving an initiative or effort forward using the nursing process as a framework or using the ADPI acronym. And sections eight and nine include a resource hub and references. So let's now do a deeper dive into each of these sections. And I'll turn things over back to Perry. Thanks. Thanks, Lisa. Um, if we could go to the next slide, please. Um, let's look at section one. Section one provides both the overview and purpose of the toolkit. It also includes critical definitions for the toolkit, such as health disparities, health equity, and culture of health. This ensures that teams are using consistent language while action planning. There's also a table that includes many of the social determinants of health within the framework depicted by the slide. Um, and this is from he Healthy People 2020. There actually is an update of people, uh, Healthy People 2030, which is essentially has the same information. As action coalitions review the social determinants of health included in the table, please note that this is not intended to be an exhaustive list. Rather, it is an example of some of the fundamental social determinants of health as well as emerging social determinants of health. You'll see terms used like housing insecurity rather than how we previously thought of it as homelessness. And this notion of how housing insecurity reflects a broader understanding of how living conditions impact health outcomes. The um, table includes emerging social determinants um, such as discrimination and social isolation. If you would turn to the next slide. So section two assesses your knowledge and preparedness to address the social determinants of health. So consistent with the five steps of the nursing process, 
we recommend that action coalitions conduct a self-assessment to determine their readiness um, and the needs that they might have for addressing the social determinants of health. So this process includes acknowledging and reflecting on existing work efforts and achievements through the process of appreciative inquiry. Next slide, please. Um, so uh, let's talk a little bit about the social determinants of health assessment survey. So this has been adapted with permission from Drs. Janice Phillips and Angelique Richard from uh, Rush University Medical Center Department of Nursing Administration to fit the needs of the state action coalitions. The survey includes uh, 10 questions and takes really less than 10 minutes to complete. And the results may help determine action steps or begin to support your health equity work. So there'll be questions about you and your practice. Um, there'll be questions about health equity and social determinants of health. It'll ask you about confidence level, discussing certain topics, particularly inequities with your patients and community. Um, how likely are you to discuss health equities with your patient and community? And what are the major barriers that prevent you from addressing health inequities experienced by your patients and communities? Next slide, please. So uh, section three is all about the community assessment. So teams can use resources on the slide also included in the toolkit to collect objective data related to community strengths and resources. This process is also called an environmental scan. This phase includes gathering information about communities challenges and resources. Ideally participants who identify priorities are community residents health professionals and other local leaders. Nurses are in a unique position to conduct a community assessment because they often have firsthand knowledge of the most critical health needs that their patients and communities experience. A community assessment will also highlight the assets, strengths and resources within a community that residents can build upon. We don't wanna approach this with a deficit model. We wanna also focus on the strength, expertise and wisdom of our communities. So we can obtain input from as many sectors in the community when identifying a community's assets and strengths. We can begin an inventory or a list to document these assets. These may include organizations, people, places, associations, coalitions, and institutions. Other sources of information are of course the internet, community websites, uh, chambers of commerce, local newspapers, and county health departments. Next slide. Um, if you could click uh, again, there we go. So uh, one of the ways to think about approaches for working with communities is, is the framework of cultural humility. So within a cultural humility framework, we know that we're going to recognize and honor the expertise that resides within communities. We don't go into communities and pretend that we know better than they know what it is that their community needs. So we also need to assume that individuals from groups different from our own have the wisdom and ability to teach and learn, to problem solve and to innovate. So this shapes the way that we can um, partner with and uh, support communities as, as we're looking at different social determinants of health and health inequities. Lisa, I'm gonna hand it back over to you for section four. Thanks, Gary. Next slide, please. So next is section four, social diagnosis and deciding. The value of addressing the social determinants of health is reflected by how in primary healthcare and clinical settings, there are growing efforts to link the social determinants of health to the ICD-10 diagnoses. ICD-10 is an acronym for the International Statistical Classification of Diseases and Related Health Problems, the 10th revision, so also known as the ICD-10 diagnoses. In a community setting, once you conduct an assessment, action coalitions or any coalition using the toolkit can work with partners and stakeholders to define and prioritize the social determinants to address. One simple recommendation made by the community toolbox which is in the toolkits resource hub, 
is to list all of the social determinants that your community is facing and use criteria that can help decide what action to take and when. So this slide includes a sample of some of those criteria to consider when making decisions. Next slide, please. Section five, planning, or the P in the ADPI acronym. Community problems are often too complex for any one agency to address, making community engagement an essential step for developing community-based solutions and advancing health equity. Community engagement is a process that engages community members, organizations, institutions, and other relevant stakeholders to pursue solutions and or interventions that address the issue at hand. Central to this process is recognizing that again, community members are the most important resource in the community. Relationship building with community members takes time and involves certain strategies. In the toolkit, we include a link to the CDC's A Practitioner's Guide for Advancing Health Equity for strategies on more meaningful community engagement. We also recommend uh, that coalitions consider partnering with the Ethnic Minority Nurse Associations listed on the slide here, as well as the American Association for Men in Nursing for the work that you have before you. Next slide, please. Also a part of planning is determining potential coalition membership. And we include this graphic to illustrate examples of potential coalition members. And this was adapted from the Community Wellness Planning Kit. And this is just an example and it's not intended to be an exhaustive list. Next slide, please. Also in planning, there needs to be a communication action plan. And this is a table that we've included that asks the teams to plan and write out how they can and will reach out to potential champions, stakeholders, and team members. Next slide, please. Also part of planning is establishing a strategic plan. And in the toolkit, we include uh, templates to help establish smart strategic plans. Um, for example, we recommend developing smart goals, which are goals that are specific, measurable, realistic, achievable, and time-based. Uh, goals that will support the coalition's efforts. Next slide. More on planning is fundraising. And we include many links uh, with more information on fundraising to support diversity work and fundraising toolkit materials. All the links are listed here and hyperlinked um, within the toolkit. Next slide, please. Section six is about action and implementation. In the toolkit, we include hyperlinks with multiple examples of nurses in the field and in action. These example, examples are meant to serve as inspiration as teams brainstorm what to be done or what can be done. And these examples are also include, including hands-on strategies that may be useful in implementing action plans. Next slide. Section seven is all about evaluating impact. So in terms of recognizing and recognition, what has changed in the issues of the community that you hope to address? Considering replication, could your strategies be replicated by another community? And if so, how? As you plan and implement, it's also essential um, to ask yourselves, what policy suggestions could you make as a result of your efforts? And also what health outcomes or health behaviors have changed a result, as a result of your work. In the toolkit, there are additional references for guidance on evaluation. 
One article we include is titled Evaluating Strategies for Reducing Health Disparities by Addressing the Social Determinants of Health, a 2016 article in the publication of Health Affairs. In this article reviews evidence from promising interventions that focus on the social determinants of health, targeting education and early childhood, urban planning and community development, housing and economic stability. These examples may help guide your evaluation on health outcomes, cost effectiveness, and long-term sustainability for implementation at local, state, and national levels. Next slide. Section eight is the resource hub. And we have a resource hub that contains a list of additional resources that may help your teams with your endeavors. And please note that the toolkit, again, is a living document. So if there is a resource that you know of um, that has been valuable to you and is related to the social determinants of health and health equity, please consider sharing it uh, with us and so that we can add it to the list. You can email Jasmine Cooper at jncooper at aarp.org. Next slide. All right, so now we've come to the point in our webinar where we are going to uh, utilize breakout groups to come together and share with others who are attending today. Uh, shortly, we will move everyone to a breakout group room and in your groups, you'll discuss the following. First, identify a health inequity and health disparity that you would like to address in your breakout room. Then using the example from the above question, identify three to four potential partners and champions who can move this effort forward. Finally, craft one or two sentences or selling points that you might use to persuade potential partners and champions that this effort is worth investing in and would be of benefit to them and or their community members or constituents. Next slide, please. Each group will work for 10 minutes to answer the questions on the previous slide. And the slide will be shared by a tech lead um, in each breakout room. We will all report back um, in a larger room after 10 minutes. And depending on the remaining time available, we'll either share vocally or through the chat function or the chat feature. Um, included on your screen. And the chat feature can be found at the bottom of your screen. So we'll go ahead and move into the breakout rooms now. And we'll look forward to seeing you back in 10 minutes. Awesome. What I am interested in doing is hearing from some of the, oh yeah, sorry about that. Let me start my video. Um, we'd like to hear from some of the groups about some of the things that you might have come up with. So just remember, we were asking you to think about a health equity or um, health disparity that you would like to talk about. Um, think about who would be some potential partners and then what you would use as selling points. So I would really love it if we could have some people uh, raise their hand. Let's go um, Sandra, Wynn, and then Melissa. Hello, everyone. I was voluntold by my group, so I'm going to do the best <laughs> I can to represent them. Thank um, you. I'm in the state of West Virginia, and one of the things that we were talking about is um, with health disparities was that the pandemic has been the great leveler in, to, in yeah. terms of the haves and the have nots. And so one of the things, you know, we can't uh, unfortunately change the economics of the situation, but one thing that we could hopefully change that would improve the lives of others is access to care. That is still a major issue, whether it's an economic one or um, social determinants of health related um, 
perhaps you know a mental health problem or other problem that is preventing someone from being able to fill out the paperwork for the Affordable Care Act. Mm -hmm. So we said access to care and we said several groups that we'd wanna partner with. Uh, in particular, uh, our populations need to see people who they can relate to. So for example, the National Black Nurses Association, Latinx group nurses, the US Public Health Service. So we really want to partner with um, underrepresented communities, uh, BIPOC people, minorities, so that the patients who are gonna be the most at risk will see that there is a, a person out there that A, looks like them and B, that can help them help themselves. And so we were talking about not only nurses, but partnering with social workers to uh, enlist case management, population health, um, the PCPs to uh, help out and engage, and then also financial counselors because a lot of uh, folks need help in that realm. And then uh, the one or two sentences is basically, again, encapsulating that um, our patients can't do this alone and they need to see people who, uh, Marion Wright Edelman said it best, if you can't see what you can't be, mm -hmm. they need to see that there are healthy people out there and there are people who can help them. So um, that's what our group came up with. Thank you. Oh, what a lovely way to start off this conversation. All of that sounded, um, Really amazing. So, one of the I key thank my group. That, what's that? Oh yeah, the entire group. Thank you to the entire group, and you represented well, Sandra. So that that notion of access to care is is really important. The campaign for action um, has been really talking about how can we move this um, topic forward because it's so very very important. Um, one of the things that that I would caution groups about is being uh, overly broad. And so the term access to care could mean anything from transportation to the fragmentation of care that folks experience when they got to the clinic. It sounded like though, through your conversation, that you were really talking about how do we get people access to um, services and insurance, Affordable Care Act. Um, and that was really great. I loved what you talked about. I wrote down, like we talk about concordant care, like um, racial match and concordant care. I was thinking about how important it is to have concordant navigation of access to care. You know, like we haven't used those terms, but that's really what you're talking about. We're patient navigators that represent the group. So um, that sounded really great and was just a, such a great way to start us off. Absolutely, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Wynn, I think you were next. If you want to um, take care of the breakout groups first, and then I'll raise my question. Oh, okay. Sounds great. Um, Melissa, were you next? All righty. So the My Breakup Out group um, started with naming a few things, um, hot topics that are related to health and equity, of course, food insecurity, housing insecurity, access to health care. But we seem to settle on the lack of diversity in our profession in nursing as the main issue and as a way to indirectly get to this access of, to healthcare issue. Then we drilled down further and talked about retention and even racism in our profession as there was a recent paper published. And someone in my group did eloquently say who published it, I don't recall um, specific to that issue. And then, of course, as Sandra's group did, we also brought in this issue of the effect of the pandemic on health equity. As far as key stakeholders and partners, um, we came up with the academic institutions. If we're going to talk about the lack of diversity in our profession, it really does start in the academic institutions, and that includes nursing faculty. So we thought those were our key stakeholders. But um, when we talked about selling points, the healthcare organizations and hospitals also came up so that they should also be included as a key stakeholder. Um, other selling points would be um, mentorships for students to help to support students is important when you're talking about um, increasing diversity in the profession. Again, the healthcare organization as partners to support students financially. Um, was recognized as a big one. And then I just want to give props. I wrote down Carrie's name. I didn't get her last name. 
she started with um, an idea, but we got closed out with the time. <laughs> when I can summarize what I heard from her was that we need to consider various creative options to retain students. But she was giving very good specific examples and we got cut off. Okay. Well, we only gave you 10 minutes. So there, there wasn't enough time really to finish this conversation. Um, I loved how you talked about you. There were many different um, topics, food insecurity, housing insecurity. And you'll see that most of the topics intersect in so many ways. But this notion of um, the lack of diversity in nursing, another topic that is near and dear to the campaign for actions, a, a space that we have been in and really have focused on and would like to continue to focus on. Um, and I mean, it's all pipeline work. You can talk about faculty, you can talk about students and students at so many levels, students retaining ones that we've already admitted, making sure that we have a pool, which means looking at you know, community college, pre-nursing, high schools, elementary schools, the National Black Nurses Association just gave out some grant funding for different chapters to address third to sixth graders, to get them interested early in the notion of, um, of becoming a nurse. So the, the different folks that you said you would reach out to, academic institutions, nursing faculties, but hospitals as well. Hospitals have a lot of um, leverage and you know, they can talk about the need for all of these things. Yes, Sandra, um, funding for HBCUs, like all of these things. So again, um, diversity in nursing is, is huge. So it would be difficult for an action coalition to say, we're gonna fix this. But what is it that your action coalition or your group could do in your community, especially tactics that could be replicated across the country, right? Like that is something that would be really, really amazing. I see that there's lots of stuff happening in the chat. Um, I want to open it up. Thank you so much, Melissa. Thank you for, to the group for your amazing conversation. I want to, uh, if there's anybody else that wants to report on, on their conversation, kind of your last chance to raise your hand and tell us what your group was talking about. Mercedes Thomas has her hand raised. Okay, I somehow I lost the raised hands. Mercedes Thomas. Hi, um, Perry. I wasn't sure if we were able to just unmute ourselves. <laughs> um, so my group, we decided on maternal child health disparities, um, specifically with the disparities for Black women um, dying in childbirth um, and infant mortality. Um, we identified a few stakeholders, um, such as Black Mamas Matter, um, due to their community level work that they do, um, really reaching into the community with stakeholders and making them a part of the conversation. Um, the Black Maternal Health Caucus, um, headed by Representative Underwood, um, with some of the Momnibus legisla le legislature and the Build Back Better plan, <coughs> excuse me. And then also someone identified the Nurse Family Partnership. So for people that are not familiar, like a nurse visiting program um, in communities um, that work with families in the home. Um, we think that community outreach um, is an important piece, um, engaging the community, um, making sure that you speak to the community um, in order to make changes, providing resources that are gonna be equitable um, within the community and then considering where each person is at as an individual. Um, I think as nurses, this wasn't really discussed. I made a comment to it, um, so I don't want to single anybody out. But I think as nurses, we need to um, be aware of our unconscious bias, um, especially those of us that are heading um, classrooms. Um, someone made a comment, maybe it was un, um, unconscious, so I'll <laughs> speak to it as an unconscious bias. But the comment was made that we are, we all see ourselves as equal. Um, and so maybe the person didn't realize they were saying that, but that's really important to be very cognizant of what we're saying. Um, they did agree <laughs> um, after that we're not all equal, but we have to right. be really careful when we're leading the future nurses, um, future mm -hmm. generations, making comments about um, such as Black people's skin being thicker, um, those types of things. I, I'm a lactation consultant as well. Um, 
So some of those things are unconscious that we may say sometimes um, during conferences in front of students and it can be really damaging. So I think we have to um, just be more aware of our unconscious bias when we're going out and doing this community work. Wow, Mercedes, I, I'm scribbling down all of the stuff that you have said. So many great things. Um, I loved how you talked about Black Mamas Matter and uh, the Black Maternal Health Caucus. Like these are groups that have been brilliant in bringing together groups of people to move forward a specific issue. So why not tap into those organizations and say, these are happening broadly. How can we make this happen in our specific area? But like, there's no reason to necessarily reinvent the wheel, rather to say, we're gonna focus on this in our community. Um, I loved what you said about nurses going and um, like potentially visiting mamas in their homes. Um, I remember having that as a first time mom, somebody came to my home and I was kind of blown away by how much that meant and how much I needed that and didn't know that I needed that. And then engaging the community Mercedes, this is so important that particularly for black women, there are so many reasons for black women to mistrust the healthcare system. Part of that has to do with the experience of biases, whether they've come from the providers as conscious or unconscious biases. But a lot of communities don't trust us in healthcare. And so authentically engaging communities, making sure that their voices are front and center in terms of any sort of intervention is gonna go a long ways in, um, in, uh, in any effort that we have, right? So I just really appreciate all the things that you said. Um, in the last couple minutes, I'm going to turn to Winifred Quinn, who had her hand up, and I believe she had a question that she wanted to ask. Oh, I do have a question. Thank you so much, Piri. Thank you um, to um, Melissa Mercedes and the third person who represented your breakout group. And, um, uh, <clears throat> and for the conversation. So my question, so I'm not a nurse. Um, I'm with AARP. And I think the Health Equity Toolkit is a terrific tool for action coalitions and, uh, and nurses, I would say, if you're organizing around health equity. My question is, um, it's, there's a, a, a nursing, a lot of nursing information and language in here, not so much for organizations not having to do with nursing. So even though I'm responsible for our diversity and nursing work for the campaign, um, I wonder if there's a possibility if the current iteration is appropriate for um, uh, organizations that are not nursing specific, like AARP state offices, or is it time for us at the campaign to consider creating uh, an adap adapting one for the consumer to use, for patient organizations to use? And we have less than three minutes left, <laughs> so we don't have to answer that now, but yeah. something for us to consider offline. Well, this was something that came up as we talked about, you know, as a campaign creating a toolkit. And honestly, we went back and forth on this. And we really did want nurses to see themselves as an important uh, part of moving health equity forward. And you know, just in, in my own time talking with nurses and nursing students, a lot of times people would say, well, health disparities and health inequities, it's important and it's interesting, but what does it have to do with me? I, I take care of patients, right? And right. it's like, whoa, those, those are not two separate things. Like we actually are taking care of patients, which means we're central to this. So that was part of why we created the toolkit to be a little more nursing focused, but our hope was that we created it in a way that would make sense to people, even if they weren't nurses, like ADPI, like that's the nursing process, but everything in there is fairly self-explanatory, right. like assessment, right. like all of those things. So we're hoping that there's not too much jargon, but I would love to have a conversation with groups that are not nursing to make sure that it does seem welcoming and- yeah. So maybe yeah. we can, I can pull in uh, one or two state office folks, ARP state office folks, and we uh -huh. use this toolkit, we use the toolkit as it is, but then we create other language for the, how ARP state offices could use it. Sounds wonderful. 
That All right, great. great. Do you want to close us out, Wynn? Um, yes. And uh, uh, okay, so Jasmine is going to send out um, the toolkit to everybody, so you'll you'll get it there. Um, and uh, let me pull up my formal. Uh, <laughs> um, thank you. So. Uh, as was mentioned in the beginning, uh, if you missed a section of the webinar or would like to pass it on to a colleague, which again, we hope you do, um, you can find the recording, a webinar summary, and additional webinar resources by going to www.campaignforaction.org forward slash webinars. Be sure to follow us on Twitter, join us on Facebook, and sign up for our bi-weekly campaign update and also on campaignforaction.org. I put a link to the campaign update in the chat earlier. Again, I also want to um, express my gratitude to Dr. Piri ackerman Barger, Dr. Lisa Martin, uh, Jasmine Cooper, Aidan McCallion, um, Anna Hervada helped out today, uh, Jordan Green helped out today, maybe Lynn Mertz helped out today. So this, uh, uh, Anita Jackson, so thank you all to um, the leaders of today, the executive producer being Jasmine and all the my teammates who helped out. And especially an, a heartfelt thank you on behalf of ARP's 38 million members to all of the nurses and nursing educators out there. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much for all that you do every day. Thank you. <laughs>